We now reach the middle of the 20th century where a decisive intellectual change happened. There was something of a revolution which affected very many branches of science and technology and would put its stamp on all future cognitive science. Behaviorism at this point did not go away, but it stopped being the dominant paradigm in Anglo-American academic psychology. Many of the behaviorists went on to apply their techniques in the commercial world. So although today psychology departments have precious few behaviorists in them, the marketing departments of all the large companies and supermarkets and so on are stuffed full of them. Every time you go to Tesco or any large department store, your behavior is being subtly modified by manipulation of the external environment, and there's money to be made in it. However, as a way of understanding ourselves, it has lost much of its force. And in part, this came about because of what we're going to call the cognitive turn. We associate the cognitive turn with the period from the end of the Second World War up until the 1960s, and it's, to some extent, this is still going on. It became the dominant paradigm within which such themes were explored um, from 1960 to, well, one could say to the present, but I think its influence is waning somewhat, or is changing. Things are always changing. There was a bunch of things that came together in the middle of the 20th century that contributed to the emergence of what is a radical sea change in the language with which we discuss ourselves, our brains, our minds, our motivations. Some of the principal landmarks are outlined there. They run from 43 to 73. 1973 saw the birth of the term cognitive science. Back in 43, there was a publication of an article, we'll see, which made explicit a possible link between computation and neurons. In 1945, John von Neumann introduced a, an abstract model of a computer, which went on to be the template, as it were, for all computers built ever since. Um, the von Neumann architecture provided a framework within which computational theories could uh, be implemented. Then after the Second World War, there was a series of, confer of conferences known as the Macy Conferences, which were explicitly interdisciplinary. They brought together people from very many disciplines and they had a profound effect on those disciplines going forward. There were huge innovations, perhaps the most single most influential one of which was the development by Claude Shannon and others, Shannon and Weaver particularly, of a, um, a theory which became known as information theory. Um, or as it was then, a mathematical theory of communication. These influences shifted the landscape, and then language became involved. So we've seen behaviorists and their approach to modifying behavior, primarily studying animals. Language proved to be a stumbling block for behaviorism, and um, in a very influential move, a young academic at that time called Noam Chomsky introduced a very different perspective on language, which made behaviorist approaches appear redundant. That was a landmark view, and from this point on, language becomes totally integrated into our thinking about minds, brains, and behavior. Um, this all gave rise to a new form of psychology, which is often called cognitive psychology. And cognitive psychology is emphatically not the same thing as cognitive science. It is one of the manifestations of these acts of questioning um, from a particular disciplinary point of view. So this sets the stage then um, against which most of the future developments that we will be covering in this module are situated. Let's have a look at some of them. This is the basic architecture of the computer. It treats the computer as a self-contained device that accepts inputs and produces outputs. Between input and output, there is a structure in which the control is centralized and there's a central unit called the CPU, which causes the instructions to be carried out. 
and it interfaces with an internal memory store in which traces of previous computations are stored. It seems so simple, but this architecture has been incredibly influential. Now, those conferences I talked about from 1946 to 1953, they don't still go on. They were specific to this time and they were highly interdisciplinary. They brought together mathematicians, physicists, biologists, psychiatrists, anthropologists, wide variety of people concerned uh, with different aspects of human behavior. They were all from, they were from very different disciplines, but this had grown largely out of the forced collaboration during the wartime, in which at one stage, many of these luminaries were sequestered to Mexico, where their governments hid them in order to work on wartime projects. And while they were there, they started talking among themselves. They were each very prominent in their own individual disciplines. So they decided to take advantage of this strange circumstance in order to develop a common language. And the theme that emerged, the common theme, was the notion of control. Control meant something very different in each of these disciplines. And so they started to ask, how can we talk across these disciplinary boundaries? After the war, then, that gave rise to these uh, conferences. Um, one science that was birthed there then is was known as cybernetics. Norbert Wiener was crucially involved in developing missiles, guided missiles. Um, a lot of this work comes out of the wartime activity, as we said. Cybernetics was originally construed as the scientific control, study of control and communication in the animal and the machine. Broader interpretations exist. Gregory Bateson is an anthropologist of note who uh, had a cybernetic focus as well, and he saw it much more broadly as a branch of mathematics dealing with problems of control, recursiveness, and information, with a focus on the patterns that connect us. Here's an example of a mugshot from one of those Macy conferences, and you can have fun picking out people there yourself. Um, I mentioned Claude Shannon's mathematical theory of communication as being extremely important. This was developed in Bell Labs, and it was a mathematical theory of the, um, the transmission of mess coded messages from a sender to a receiver over a channel that might be noisy. It gave rise to such um, absolutely world-changing notions as a bit, a bit of information, which is either one or zero. So it's based on this logical distinction between ones and zeros. Okay, um, it generated a new notion of entropy, which was a notion taken over from physics. It means in, in a physical context, entropy has to do with the disorganization of matter, the lack of structure. The same concept found application in an altered sense within information theory, when it referred to the possibility of noise or interference in communication. This theory has been wildly over-applied. It is very specific theory, with, um, very strongly formal, um, but it has given rise to the slightly deluded belief that the universe is simply full of information. That is, uh, has generated more problems than it solves. Um, the generality of the notion of the computer started to get minds thinking. They started to think of minds as computation, as computers themselves. This gave rise to some famous thought experiments. For example, there on the left, Alan Turing, who had come up with the most general possible mathematical description of the computer, wondered if down the line, one could envisage a computational system that responded to inputs um, in a manner similar to the way that humans respond to inputs. His thinking on this was not to suggest that machines might be intelligent, merely that they might acquire the veneer of appearing to be intelligent if subjected to a particular kind of test, which he saw as interaction by text over a computer keyboard to one of two systems, where the operator has to guess from the responses of the systems, are they human or are they machine? It was never intended as a definition of intelligence or to see whether something was or was not intelligent. It was intended to see to ask the question whether systems could be engineered so as to display the appearance of intelligence. Another thought experiment from this time, the Chinese room experiment by the philosopher John Searle, 
asked a question of a fictitious input-output system in which messages in Chinese are put in and the system re delivers responses in Chinese, but inside the box is actually a person who's got, who knows no Chinese but has a dictionary, a lookup table, and is using, in other words, computation or algorithms to transform the input into the output. Um, whether this makes sense in the context of a uh, discussion about language is, we're not going to get into that. But you can see the way that people have started to think differently at this point. This cognitive turn was huge. One very important and often overlooked paper here is Warren McCullough's A Logical Calculus of the Ideas Imminent in Nervous Activity. Warren McCullough is an enormously colourful and interesting character. I recommend him to you highly. In this paper, which is more often cited than read, he demonstrated that one could think of neurons, the cells, that the nerve cells in brains, as being simple logical elements that perform simple logical computations. And the illustrations on the right there are rather informal schematic diagrams of how a bunch of nerves hooked up together could be considered to be performing logical computations. And so out of all this emerged a new domain of uh, accounts of our being called the computational theory of mind. Within the many forms of computational theories of mind, human cognition is understood to be a form of information processing. Computation, that is the transformation of symbols from one form to another form in accordance with rules, provides a necessary concept to link neural activity to human cognition. Now you can see that there's lots of contributions coming together here. Warren McCullough identifies neurons with logical computational elements. Von Neumann, Turing and Shannon provide a much broader context within which we can begin to think of systems, computational systems that display uh, responses that we might be interested in. And so this framework appears to offer the, the, a way to sidestep some of the deep philosophical problems that we've already met. And, and the computational theory of mind is not a single theory, it's a broad framework within which most cognitive, cognitive psychologists today work. And in these, cognition is viewed as the manipulation within the system of representations generated from inputs leading to outputs. This notion of representation goes all the way back to Immanuel Kant, as we've said. There are problems with viewing people as boxes that produce outputs in response to inputs. We've seen one of those problems when we discussed um, stimulus and response. Nevertheless, this has proved to be enormously fruitful. And money, research money, started to flow in this direction. And around this time then, as we've seen from those thought experiments, the idea that one could construct an artificial machine that displayed, well, should we say intelligence, consciousness, human-like properties, thought, these terms are all vexed. Intelligence became something of a fetish at that time. The idea that one could describe humans as intelligent, as having some property of intelligence, which begins to play a role much like the soul used to play, it's very poorly defined. Um, but the idea of an artificial intelligence was born. And while this grew out of the same ground as cybernetics, funding plays a big role. And at one stage, there was a large grant up for grabs from the United States Armed Forces. DARPA, um, which was going to go basically either to cyberneticians who were focusing on biological models of control, looking at um, similarities between artificial systems with built-in goals and the apparent goals of biological organisms, that's cybernetics, and this highly abstract notion of an artificial intelligence. Well, AI got the money. And with that, MIT Media Lab was founded. Martin Minsky was head of the large project and the course of cognitive science was changed irrevocably. One rarely hears about cybernetics these days, but as we'll see, it's making a big comeback. Um, artificial intelligence was born as this abstract goal of generating, uh, born of an intellectual, abstract, rationalist conception of the human mind. Um, 
And that sense has changed dramatically over the years since then. One should not understand the term artificial intelligence, as you read about it in today's press, as being straightforwardly the same thing as this original goal, which is quite different. Now, moving forward a little bit further, Skinner had turned his attention to human language and brought out a book called Verbal Behaviour, in which he tried to characterise um, speech behaviours as acquired habits. And this was subject to a damning review by a then young academic by the name of Noam Chomsky, still thankfully with us, but very old now, um, in which Chomsky pointed out that this behaviorist approach could never come close to accounting for anything really interesting to do with human language. Chomsky is something of a rationalist himself. The intellectual climate of the time is highly abstract um, and belongs more in the rationalist scheme of things. And rationalists tend to distrust the senses somewhat um, and they focus on innate ideas, that is, built-in ways of understanding the world, of dealing with the complexity of the world. Innateness came to be a very big part of Chomsky's picture of human language because, as he pointed out, Young children learn language, which is a very complex kind of formal code, incredibly quickly. They do it at a particular age. They do it in the presence of really messy real world examples that don't map onto this code very well. That argument is known as the poverty of the stimulus argument. And very quickly they learn not to parrot habits, but to creatively produce entirely novel sentences. Indeed, an awful lot of um, our linguistic ability becomes clear when we produce sentences that have never been said before in the entire history of humankind, including this sentence, which, just to be on the safe side, I'm going to stick a random hippopotamus into. Now, that sentence has never been said before in the history of humankind, and yet I said it, so it couldn't be a, um, a learned habit. It's at this point that um, linguistics and theories of mind really come together. Chomsky's approach to language is highly formal, computational. It sees uh, language through a lens uh, which emphasizes the role of the transformation of symbol, symbol structures in accordance with rule, which is very much the same language that is emerging from computational theories of mind. And that's why language is going to play such a decisive role in much of what comes in this module.